uh, thank you everyone for, for showing up. Um, so I'm going to tell you today, um, I'm just going to give you the, the caveat. This is, this is primarily a methods talk, so, um, I'm gonna, but I'm really going to try to tie it together with why this method is useful. So uh, what is the network history inference problem? So basically, the network hi history inference problem is we observe a number of extant uh, interaction networks. So these could be protein interaction networks or regulatory networks or perhaps even metabolic pathways. Um, and we want to figure out what the ancestral networks looked like. So what, what, what was the common ancestor of these two networks? Or along this particular evolutionary path, what were the interactions that were gained or lost? So why, why might we want to uh, infer network histories? So the idea is that predicting network histories can help answer a lot of uh, fairly interesting questions. So there's, a, there's a, an array of different questions we can answer and a lot of previous work trying to address this. So for instance, um, we could use uh, ancestral network inferences to help impute missing present day interactions. Uh, we could use it to help understand the relationships between interaction, uh, protein interactions and sequences. Um, as some of this work has even appeared previously in ISMB. We can, uh, we can use ancestral network inference uh, to have data-driven models of evolution and to try to find highly conserved functional modules. So uh, there's, there's this broad array of potential uh, uses of an ancestral network um, and a network history. So uh, the real question I'm going to try to answer here is uh, what is an efficient way to represent infer and use these network histories. So what I, what I want to present is a single framework that allows us to answer many different questions and get uh, potentially more accurate answers than existing techniques. So uh, here are three particular questions uh, that, we, that we look at in the paper and, um, and try to answer. So one is predicting extant uh, interactions. So can we impute uh, ex interactions between uh, extant proteins using an inferred network history? Uh, this can help us analyze networks and guide experiments. Uh, another is ancestral interaction inference. So can we find conserved modules, study the fine scale structure of network evolution, um, and maybe even use this for other purposes such as guiding network alignment. Um, and finally, uh, we have sort of a, a relatively uh, new utility of this, which is predicting relative duplication order. So um, can we use the network to help inform sequence-based estimates of duplication order of proteins? Uh, so what I'm, what I'm going to present is a combinatorial framework that uh, is really meant to help for encoding and decoding histories. So what do I mean by encoding histories and decoding histories? Well, by encoding histories, I mean we want in a way to efficiently represent a uh, potential space of network histories. And by decoding histories, I mean we want a way to efficiently query these, this ensemble of represented histories to answer particular questions. So the particular type of encoding I'm going to use is a directed hypergraph. I'll explain that a little bit and try, uh, try not to go too deep into it. Um, we have some advanced dynamic programming algorithms that are going to allow us to perform efficient inference over this structure. Um, and we have a, a novel algorithm that's going to give us an ensemble of parsimonious network histories that we can then use to answer uh, some of these questions. Uh, so the first thing that I, that I want to draw attention to and, and why you're really able to do this is because uh, genome and network evolution are obviously very highly coupled. So if we have this uh, you know, very simple interaction network down here uh, with different proteins, um, the, the green edges here denote protein interactions, it looks, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, just a sort of simple network. But if we draw a phylogeny on top of it, uh, we can see that you know, may maybe there's some reason for this, this particular set of interactions, right? So uh, we have these proteins A and C duplicating from X, and then uh, eventually these proteins uh, B and E and D descending from Y. And there's a lot of interactions between these two groups. So uh, maybe this is evidence of some sort of ancestral interaction here. So the, the idea is that the phylogenetic information constrains the space of possible networks that we're going to see. So let's walk through a, a, an example in slightly more detail. So what I have here is um, on the left, uh, gene duplication history, so two gene trees. Um, and on the right is the, the interaction networks that result from an, a set of ancestral interactions between these genes. Um, and so the, the key down here is basically solid green edges mean that we have an edge that is inherited from an ancestral interaction. Uh, the dotted green edges mean that we have an edge that is gained at this particular state in uh, evolution, and uh, the red dotted edge means we have an edge that's lost. So if we start out and we gain an edge between the roots of these two trees, we're going to have uh, an interaction at time zero in this ancestral network. Uh, it's, you know, fairly simple, it's just one edge. 
But then if we move down one step in time, things get a little bit more interesting. So now we have all of these green lines represent interactions that were inherited uh, by the interaction from X and Y. So when X and Y duplicate, their progeny maintain these interactions with each other. Um, but then uh, maybe there's some divergence, so uh, we lose the interaction between C and Z. Uh, finally, if we look at, if we go down to the extant network, we have this particular set of interactions that are implied. Uh, we've lost all of the pairwise interactions between C and Z, and maybe we gain a, a novel interaction uh, in, in the extant species. So uh, really what we're looking at here is a generalized duplication and divergence model of, of interaction histories where there's potentially node duplication and node loss. Um, the leaf nodes represent extant proteins, um, and we have a partial order on the genes. So we know that uh, children exist after their ancestors, so this is going to prohibit some interactions from being possible. Um, and when interactions are gained or lost between extant proteins, that state is inherited by the progeny or the descendants of those proteins. So uh, the question is, if we're given fixed duplication trees, so we have this history of how the proteins duplicated, what is the space of potential network histories? What is the space of interactions that we could have seen? So um, the first question is, uh, topologically, what, what pairs of proteins could even coexist? Like, what pairs of proteins could we have between which there could be interactions? Um, so there's a pretty, pretty simple rule here. Uh, you could imagine trying to look at the phylogenetic branch lengths and predict times for these proteins. But if, if assume we don't know or we don't use this information, uh, really any pair of proteins where uh, U and V, where neither is an ancestor of the other, could potentially interact. So for example, here, you know, X and Y can obviously interact, um, but then Y and A could also interact. If X duplicated before uh, Y did, we could have, we could have this interaction. Uh, and then potentially Y would interact with A and C. Um, so any pair of proteins that belong to the same species and one is not a uh, ancestor of the other, that, that interaction is allowable in this topology. So if we know what uh, pairs of proteins could interact, the next question is, if we know some set of interactions, how are those interactions inherited uh, as imposed by this duplication history? So for example, um, if we have proteins A and B in, in this ancestral state and they interact, uh, what, what are the options we have? So here, for simplicity, I'm only showing uh, the case where, where this protein A duplicates first. But so assume that happens, well, uh, we could have A duplicate and then X and Y could inherit these interactions, right? So um, if this protein duplicates first, we could have C interacting and, and D interacting with B. Uh, likewise, uh, we could lose this interaction. So if you know, these, the interaction uh, between these two disappears, the proteins diverge, uh, we could have no interactions between the progeny. Um, and then likewise, we can gain novel interactions, right? So if we're down here uh, between B and D, and we have, um, and we have E, uh, uh, sorry, we have B duplicating, then we have to look at this potential set of interactions. So here we could have um, the, an interaction is not inherited, uh, or sorry, there's no interaction in the ancestor, but we gain one in the progeny, and likewise there's no interaction in the ancestor and we stay that way. Uh, so really, oh, sorry. So, re so really what we have is, uh, is this structure called a hypergraph. Uh, and what we have uh, is, a way to encode the space of potential network histories. So the idea here is we're going to define uh, these two sets, V sub H and E sub H, and then these two special elements, R and C. So uh, V sub H is just uh, a potential set of uh, interactions. So it's a set of pairs of proteins and an interaction state. Either they interacted or they didn't. So these form the vertices of the hypergraph. These are the, the core elements. And then the question is, what is the relation between these elements? Well. Uh, we can represent this via a set of, of hyperarchs. So really, a hyperarch is just um, sort of these globule things I, I drew before, but the idea is uh, it, it links a subset of the vertices um, and denotes a particular element as the head. So the head would be potentially uh, the ancestral proteins, and then the tail of the hyperarch would be the, the progeny. So this encodes the dependence between different types of interactions. Uh, we have a designated root node, so if we're looking uh, at particular, two particular gene families, the designated root node would be the, top, uh, the tops of those gene duplication trees. Uh, 
Um, and then we have a cost function. So for each hyperedge, um, we can assign some sort of cost. And this could be a probabilistic cost or a parsimonious cost. You know, uh, what, is, what is the probability of gaining interaction that didn't exist ancestrally or, or vice versa? Um, so there's uh, some, some basic terminology uh, that I want to get out of the way that sort of describes this, this hyperedge scenario. So we have this, this group of vertices, right? So V is some pair of proteins in interaction state, and these are all pairs of proteins in interaction states that are related to this head node. So we call this particular element, this yellow blob here, a hyperarc, uh, E, and we denote the, the parent here as the head of E, and these nodes down here as the tail of E. And if we look at the set of all potential uh, interactions that could, have, uh, that could have come from this initial interaction, we denote this as the backward star of V. So it's the set of all of these hyperedges and the vertices within them. So, uh, so when we're, we're talking, we have now this combinatorial structure. And the idea is that this combinatorial structure really encodes the potential space of network histories that could have occurred. Uh, so what does a history look like in this structure? Well, uh, a history in this structure is a hyperpath um, from uh, some node. So assume this is the root of the hypergraph. So this represents the, you know, the most ancient ancestral network. Um, to some set of leaf vertices, which is some set of potential extant interactions. So it really looks like a tree that's embedded in this, in this combinatorial structure. And so what you see here uh, between the red and the black are two potential uh, hyperpaths from V to, uh, to the set of leaves. So we're going to call each of these a derivation. Um, and this terminology really comes from the natural language processing literature, where um, you're trying to derive this ancestral state via some set of extant ob observations. Um, and we're going to note, denote these derivations as, as D of V. Um, so what a derivation really represents is an encoding of a specific network history for the subnetworks of the proteins at V. So for the subnetworks that descend from this pair of proteins, these are, this is a potential history of interactions between those proteins, as is as the black. Um, so now if we have a, a network history, we can start to ask questions about well, what is a good network history? Because there are, there are plenty of, of network histories that, that are plausible, things that we could have seen. What, what are ones that we might really expect? So one uh, criterion we can apply is parsimony. Um, and so this is a, a dynamic program that we previously introduced um, that performs the parsimonious ancestral network reconstruction. Uh, so this is a very simplified version of the dynamic program equation, but the basic idea is you, know, you have a limited number of options between each pair of proteins, U and V, and some interaction state, S. So uh, we can break the, the options you have down like this. Well, um, if, if U duplicates before V does, uh, you have these two green conditions. And the two options are you can either maintain the interaction state that you had in the ancestors, so S goes to S. And typically, that doesn't cost you anything. Um, or you could have some cost. So here, this delta function is just how much does it cost to go from the interaction state I see between U and V to interaction state I see between the children of U and V. Uh, so that this is denoted by this S bar of, of sort of changing or flipping the interaction state. And likewise, we have a symmetric set of cases where the other protein duplicates first. So this is this dynamic program recurrence. And if we look at, at how it relates to the hypergraph, there's actually a very direct correspondence between this combinatorial structure, this recurrence equation, and this combinatorial structure, uh, this, this encoding of different states and the relationships between them, where we have each term corresponds to a hyperedge. Uh, these two hyperedges correspond to the ones where we've changed the state in the children, um, and these two correspond to the ones where we have not changed the state in the children. Uh, so the idea here is that a parsimonious history, as we could chug out by computing this recurrence, is just a minimum cost derivation of the root. So these, these trees, these hyper paths we have that are embedded in the graph, if we can find one of minimal cost, so you know, traversing the minimum number of edges where we see these deltas, um, then we can, we can find a parsimonious history in this structure. So really, this, this solution uh, of this equation is equivalent to finding this minimum cost derivation. Um, and so this is actually just a, an instance of the Viterbi algorithm. If we look at all of the, the vertices that we see in this hypergraph and we look at them in topological order, we can just look uh, at all of the hyperedges that are coming in, the cost of traversing that hyperedge, and then the cost we've already computed for the children. And if we do this for everything, by the time we get to the root, we have a parsimonious solution. Uh, so, so that's great. We can recapitulate an existing dynamic program in this new framework, but there's, uh, there's a problem with, with, with parsimony, particularly in the network history inference case, which is that there are many optimal histories. So here we have two potential different histories that yield the same extant network. 
um, and there's no reason a priori to choose one over the other. So uh, there's many optimal histories. We, we really want to sort of characterize all of them. And likewise, there are many near optimal histories that might also be interesting. So if a particular interaction occurs in uh, you know, all histories that are very close to parsimonious, we might be interested in inferring that. Uh, also, there's a huge space of valid histories, but that's slightly less interesting. Um, so uh, the idea here is that um, we came up with a new algorithm for enumerating and summarizing many histories. So we're going to keep track of the k most parsimonious derivations uh, classes for vertex. So what a the only reason I'm using the word class here is because really what we have to do if we want to look uh, at an interesting number of things is aggregate all histories that have the same cost into, into one unit because we can't really look through them one by one. There's, there's an exponential number of them. Uh, so the idea here is if I were to give you this structure, so this is just a different representation of this, this hypergraph, and I were to say I know for all of these children nodes uh, the, the cost of the best solution and the second best solution, so for example here, 7 and 15, and I know that, that say there are eight ways I can get a solution of cost 7, uh, and nine ways I can get a solution of cost 15. So if I gave you all of this information, could you tell me what the best solution is for the parent and the number of ways I can, I can obtain it? Uh, so you can, you can actually do this. All you really have to do is just look, look over all of the incoming edges and look over the children. So what we can see here is for this parent, we have um, two ways to get an optimal cost solution. So there are two ways to get a cost of nine at the parent. We can use this blue edge, which has a cost zero to traverse, but then we have to satisfy the interaction states we've seen at both of these children. So that costs five and four, so that's nine. And there are eight ways to get there because there are four ways to satisfy this child that can be combined independently with two ways to satisfy this child. Uh, we have the same case over here, except here we're traversing an edge that actually costs us something. And then we have to add five and three. Again, we get nine. There are 50 ways to get this score. And if we combine them with the parent, we see that there are nine ways. Uh, there's a cost of nine, which is the best solution. And there are 58 ways that we can get it. Uh, so here, you know, what we've really done is, is create this novel algorithm uh, that extends a sufficient k-best parsing algorithm that allows us to efficiently compute parsimony classes. Uh, it's sort of a two-phase algorithm. There's a bottom-up phase that uh, counts near optimal solutions, uh, does this thing that I sort of showed you on the last slide where you know what the costs are and how many there are, and then the top-down phase that allows the algorithm to assign scores or probabilities uh, to different potential ancestral interactions as an ensemble. Um, so, you know, I've sort of showed you this combinatorial structure now, so let me just touch quickly on some, some particular uses you might be interested in. So there's the ancestral inference problem. So what does this mean in terms of the structure we have? Well, really asking for an ancestral inference is asking in how many optimal and near-optimal histories does a pair of proteins interact? Uh, likewise, we can have extant interaction imputation. So in how many optimal or near-optimal histories do we expect this extant interaction to exist at the leaves that we, that we don't see? Uh, we can look at relative duplication order. So uh, over this, this set of, of histories, uh, how many times does U coexist with a descendant of V, uh, meaning that V must have duplicated first, or vice versa? Um, and likewise, we could you know, sample uh, histories according to this ensemble. Uh, so first, let me talk about ancestral inference. Um, so uh, this, this particular work was first done uh, by Pinney et al. in 2007, and it was uh, really a great idea. Um, because what they looked at is this BZIP family of, of dimerizing transcription factors, and uh, it has this property that there's a short region of sequence that strongly mediates interaction. So given the sequence, you can predict the interaction. So you can get uh, putative ancestral networks by, uh, by doing ancestral sequence reconstruction and then predicting whether or not interactions existed between those ancestral sequences. Uh, and we, so we see if we use that for the ground truth, we can use our framework and we get fairly high uh, numbers for being able to recall these, these ancestral networks. Um, and in general, you can look for details in the paper, but the parsimonious ensemble performs uh, as well and sometimes better than existing maximum likelihood approaches, um, but it's also much more robust to noise than single parsimony solutions. Um, likewise, we can, we can look at this problem of imputing missing edges. So we look at the same data set here, and what we did was uh, tenfold cross-validation where we remove edges that we actually know exist, and then we say if we were to predict them, what is the relative rank of those edges? So on the x-axis is the relative rank, zero being this was the first edge we predicted, the true edge, uh, one being this was the last edge we predicted. So you want this to be as skewed towards zero as possible. Um, and just as a point of comparison, we looked at a topology-based approach recently published for edge prediction. Um, and we can see that, that we do fairly well here. Most of the time, uh, the edges that we're predicting are the ones that we've actually left out in our cross-validation. Um, so the ancestral inference is giving us that. 
Um, and finally, um, we, can, we can use ancestral inference to estimate duplication order. Um, so the experiment we did here is from the ensemble of histories, we can ask what is the probability of coexistence of any pair of vertices and then use that to predict a relative duplication order. And so we built this combinatorial structure without um, any information given in the phylogenetic branch lengths. Now you can incorporate that, but we chose not to. And the question is given just the topology of the gene trees and the topology of the network, how often do, do sequence-based estimates of duplication agree with network-based estimates? And we found they actually agree fairly well. So if you look at all, all potential pairs, about 3,700 agree and only 1,300 disagree. And this is a really high p-value. We use this kendall tau uh, statistic. So the idea is just networks can meaningfully inform your estimates of divergence time. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I presented a combinatorial framework to reconstruct and analyze ensembles of histories that allows imputation of missing edges, network estimates of duplication order, and accurate reconstruction of ancestral networks. Uh, the, the network history inference problem is, I think, a principled way of aggregating information across many networks and answering these interesting queries about network evolution. Um, we have an open source software package that you can download and, and play around with and use if you're interested. Um, and in closing, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, Travel Fellowship, my postdoctoral advisor Carl Kingsford, and my current and previous group members. Thank you. Right. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that um, it's, an, it's a very interesting question because the parsimony approach definitely has its limits. And the question really should be, um, when do we want to use a model so that we can assign probabilities to things and have a maximum likelihood approach? Or maybe even better than uh, a, a simple point estimate, some sort of distribution. And when do we want to use parsimony? Um, so what we've done here is really just based on parsimony, but there's no reason you can't look at this combinatorial structure and also assign model-based probabilities to things. Um, so I think we've shown that, you know, given the current current estimates we're using for the model, at least as best we were able to do, uh, the parsimony approach is similar, maybe sometimes slightly better. But I think that as our ability to estimate the parameters of these models improves, and maybe the actual uh, uh, intricacy of these models improves, a model-based estimation might be better. But I think we can fit that into this framework. <laughs> Right, yeah, so you can, you can estimate um, things like what is the probability of maintaining or losing an interaction, and I think uh, that throwing more data at it might really be the, the solution here, because we can look at how this changes across uh, different, different families of proteins and, and whether or not there's really a, a general model for everything. Thank you. Uh, so the cost model that, um, the cost model that we use uh, is a really simple one. All right, so you have uh, a fixed cost for creating an interaction and a fixed cost for deleting an interaction. Um, and we, we, it's sort of robust to this. So if we leave those at parity, they cost the same. You get some sort of solution. It's slightly better if, as, um, if you incorporate the evidence that we know that creating interaction um, is harder than, than losing an interaction. Um, but really, the, the idea is that in that recurrence, you have this delta term. And that can really be set to anything. So ideally, what you'd want to do is come up with some sort of cost model, which wasn't really in the scope of, of our work, that explains what the, the right cost is, uh, given things like the phylogenetic branch length and whether you're gaining or losing interactions. That's, that's an interesting idea. So I, I think that cross-validation might be capable of, of giving you some estimates on those parameters. I like your, your talk. Oh, thank you. Sure. So one of them is how do you deal with uh, gene losses, given that uh, right. current genomes are yes. outdated. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, uh, what do you think that is the role of um, convergence evolution here? Because in fact, there are a lot of cross talk in this. Right. Area. Uh, yeah, so I think um, to, deal, to answer the first question, the, the model deals with gene law. So uh, you, can, you can add a term to this recurrence, which I didn't show just for the sake of simplicity, that says uh, basically if I've lost a gene in a lineage, I don't really have any exit information in it. So it's sort of like leaving this information out. Um, so the cost model can deal with that. What the right cost to assign is, again, is this question of, of building it based on your data. Um, concerning convergent evolution, I think there are, there are a number of things that we, we want to look into in the future. So I think how convergent evolution 
solution fits in with this history encoding is one. Another is um, if we do this for different types of organisms, things like lateral gene transfer might be more important to incorporate. So here it's really this duplication and inheritance based uh, core model that uh, potentially we could incorporate these other things, but we haven't really looked at that yet. Any other questions? Thanks.